Harley? Mm -hmm. So we're going to deal with a scenario that focuses hey, on internal hemorrhage get my litter and over here. damage control resuscitation. Get this guy ready to so move. The POI for this block, we're not dealing with burns, we're not dealing with a crike or a surgical airway. The whole point of this exercise, which I have seen these wound patterns, is this guy is generally okay, except he has GSWs to the chest, right? And more often than not, what happens, and I have seen this in real life, is they're going to be okay. Sometimes they're even walking and they're with it, albeit in a little bit of pain, and they start decompensating rapidly. And when they go, they fucking really go. Because a fighting age male like yourself can compensate relatively well. So you can stay walking for five, ten minutes, and you're, in, you, uh, excuse me, you're in shape enough to where your blood is shunting properly, you're still moving, but when you hit the ground, you're fucking toast, right? So I had a casualty that had a GSW to the back, okay, upper back, like upper middle left, um, was okay. He presented fine. And I elevated the criteria for medevac because I knew what was coming. He was totally fine. I walked him off the objective after we were obviously had security established. Minimal treatments, chest seals, got him stripped down, trauma naked, see what he had going on. He was okay. 20 minutes later, he was flying out on a helicopter, and 10 minutes after that, he was decompensated with bilateral chest tubes, right? And so, he literally, him and I walked off the objective, and I had another guy with me, and he was fine. Like, he was like, I'm good, I'm good. And then, within 40 minutes, he was fucking flat on his back, getting surgery and getting blood transfusion, because that GSW, or that bullet, had hit something, some sort of circulatory vessel internal, right? So two things for this training. Number one is understanding that you go through the march sequence, you hit all your wickets, you ensure there's no massive hemorrhage, no issues with airway. The emphasis is understanding that the MOI or mechanism of injury is GSW to the trunk, chest, and having a high index of suspicion for um, going into shock, right, and decompensated. So what we're looking for is a general gradual degradation of level of consciousness pulse rate elevating and weakening simultaneously, right? <clears throat> so what you might have is you start off with a pulse rate. So we'll start off with a radial pulse, right? I'm always going to check radial and carotid, okay? I could feel you have a strong radial pulse right now. Your carotid is clicking along with it. Somebody who's actually decompensating and bleeding internally or bleeding to death and goes into shock, pulse rate elevates because the body's trying to compensate for having less fluid in the container and it's getting weaker because as you lose blood pressure, your extremities are gonna be the first things that lose circulation. Your body is gonna naturally shunt blood back towards the core to preserve your internal organs and perfuse them with oxygen-rich blood. Okay. So because we're focusing on damage control resuscitation and being on top of that because that's what's gonna save his life, that is what we're gonna set up for ourselves. That's the point of this block of instruction. Right? I want to do a good, thorough head-to-toe assessment. I want to rule out any sort of massive hemorrhage that's compressible or amenable to tourniquet, tourniquet use, right? I want to check all that. His airway is going to be okay. But the way this runs at the schoolhouse is if you fuck around or you get messed up with patient movement or you take too much time or maybe your IV stick isn't good or you can't make a decision on whether to start blood, right? Where you're trying to game the game and you think something else is going on and you don't start damage control resuscitation quickly, that patient's going to decompensate, which mimics reality, and you're going to fucking have a dead guy, right? So the best thing we can do for this guy with two GSWs in the chest and nothing else, who is now going into shock, is start blood and get medevac going. This is something that we have passed the decision point of we're not getting immediate evac, and we have a casualty that calls for it, right? So usually it's uncontrolled bleeding inside the trunk or in the box below the neck up to the, or from the belly button up to the neck, right? Um, they're decompensating, they're in shock. We can't, do, we can't do any external intervention to stop bleeding in the chest or abdomen, right? So all we can do is monitor vitals and get blood pressure up with whole blood, right? This is the best thing for somebody. We don't do Hexen anymore. We don't do colloids, any of that shit. It's blood products. If we have, if I don't have fresh whole blood products on my back, which I usually do, I will call out over the net call for team internal radio, ROLO. So it's Ranger O low tighter. It's a Ranger SOP. I know guys on my team that are O negative and or I know who can cross type and match with who. 
somewhere on their kit, usually on their back panel or on their plate flap. <clears throat> Everybody keeps a vampire bag on them, right? So we all have a vampire bag somewhere in our kit, and we all have an IV kit, and everyone's cross-trained. So in a perfect world, anybody on the team can go to that guy, get an IV started on him, an, an uh, admin IV, and pull a unit of blood from him. So while I'm dealing with whatever else this casualty has going on <clears throat> and dealing with communications, coordinating medevac, et cetera, I know that that blood unit is starting. I don't have to draw blood and deal with the casualty at the same time, right? Little stick. So blood bag, right? You guys have donated blood before, and you got the two knots on the bag, okay? So uh, it's easier to do before the fact when you don't have a bloody needle hanging off of it or you've got a bloody line, right, swinging around. So you tie two knots. This is going to be the end of it, and then this keeps the blood in the bag, right, and this just kind of keeps it from leaking. So I pre-tie these, and these bags uh, have a preservative in them that is citrate-based, and so you can get up to like three or four before you have to start dealing with the metabolic effects of the preservative in this bag. Now, what I've been told is when you pop the needle off of this, there's like negative pressure, right, in this system. And so that, I pop the needle off, the cap, excuse me, and this line gets depressurized and doesn't work anymore, right? Um, I've seen it done without clamps, but the reason for the clamp is you uncap it, and in theory, that preserves the negative pressure in the line that starts the blood flowing into the bag. Does that make sense? So we can try it without the clamp, but I don't really want to burn a bag, so we're going to do it this way. So having said that, I'm going to uncap. your other hand, hold here, just kind of gently hold it. All right, now I'm going to place the bag on the ground, let gravity help us out a little bit, and I'm going to unclip, and we should be flowing. So, we've got blood in the line going all the way down, and you can see by the rate of movement of the blood in the line that this is not a super fast process, right? So I put a 16 gauge needle in you that's relatively large. The 14 would be the next step up, but 16 flows pretty quick. Yeah, it's just an IV, buddy. Nothing wrong with your arm, okay? It's just your chest. We've got it taken care of. What I'm going to do is give you some blood, okay? You hear me, bud? Yeah. Okay. Fucking Zulu Delta One. Bravo Three is fucked up. Good copy. 